So welcome everyone. I'm, I'm James Schulman from the American Council of Learned Societies. And I'm going to get us started because we have great speakers and I, uh, I want to get give them plenty of time. Uh, a few uh, thoughts on the Commission on Fostering and Sustaining Diverse Digital Scholarship that uh, last spring, if any of you were in Denver, anyone in Denver for, okay, we got a few people. So we had um, a great session with three of the members of this commission, Mary Emma Graham, uh, Meredith Evans, and Maria Cotera, uh, talking about their collection building efforts and uh, in the, and a lot of, some of the people on the commission have uh, built over time, you know, amazing collection, digital collections. Um, and they talked about that path and the collection building and then as one aspect of, of what this commission is looking at. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, NEH and Mellon who both uh, helped support this commission. And I want to also thank uh, if anyone in the room has participated in one of 23 focus groups that we conducted uh, as part of this commission. So uh, 23 separate groups because uh, when we heard about, when we talked to the um, people who led an earlier commission in 2004, five, um, that ACLS, the Cyber Infrastructure uh, for the Humanities, project, they felt like they didn't have enough time with enough communities, so we had 23 groups, so four publishers, four groups of librarians and archivists, uh, department chairs in English, department chairs in history, uh, clear fellows, so all different groups, uh, so we were really trying to get, um, cover the landscape. That, those focus groups, one of the advantages of Zoom is we have transcripts for everything. Those focus groups will be uh, the sort of the backbone of, of the upcoming report, uh, and it's wonderful to have all that recorded. Um, so the report itself, the substance is there. Uh, we've we have a draft that we've been reviewing and talking with each of the 21 commissioners about. Um, the substance is there, but uh, the rhetorical uh, framing is uh, is the next job to to take all this material covering uh, digital work in a range of fields in every aspect of digital work from from soup to nuts um, and try to uh, make sure that it's talking to the right audiences in the right way. So that's that's sort of the update, part of the update uh, on the report. Um, and I'm now gonna talk uh, just briefly on one slide before turning it over to my colleagues. So this is a little bit of the outline. This is the outline. These are all links. So if, uh, if we wanted to let you in under the hood and see all crazy draft, you could follow these links. So I gotta fix that before we submit this to CNI. Um, but, and just to give you a sense of the structure of the, of the the report of the um, of the commission. So there are th really three major sections. One is uh, the top line for those who are far from the text, uh, rebalancing the relationship between higher education and various community outside communities outside the gates. So uh, I'll, um, uh, it's highlighted in green because to some degree that's what one of our presenters, uh, Gabby Ventura, is going to talk about today. Uh, the second category is the role of institutions in the challenge of institutional change. Self-explanatory, but not easy to do. Uh, and then a, a section, a large section on infrastructures of various kinds, and Carol is going to talk about that. And so you see under infrastructures, there are um, seven or eight different topics, I think eight different topics. Uh, and one of them is human resources, pipelines, and labor. And uh, to some degree, to whatever degree, uh, uh, he is inclined. Uh, Professor Kenton Ramsey is going to touch on that. So those, the reason those two are highlighted in green is because two of our commissioners are here today. Let me just say a word about, um, uh, about uh, our speakers. So Carol Mandel, many of you know, uh, Dean Emeritus of the Libraries at NYU, and really uh, someone that uh, I've worked with for a long time, but I can't think enough for how hard she works on this project. Uh, a just unbelievable amount of uh, so the energy that went into running a major research university library, um, we we're supposed to have like a quarter of our time or something like that, and we have like 110% of that energy, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and then um, two of our 21 commissioners are here. So uh, one is, uh, is Gabby Ventura from University of Houston, who also has more energy than, uh, than any 27 people I know. So she runs Arte Publico, the, the preeminent uh, Spanish publishing and and bilingual publishing house. Uh, uh, and then she also runs the uh, United, US uh, Latina Digital Humanities 
project, which is not a project, it's a cluster of projects based at the University of Houston. And she's a full-time professor, and she teaches, and she writes, and she does more than that. And so uh, we're just delighted that she could make time to come up here. Uh, Kenton Ramsey, Professor Camps Kenton Ramsey, now at Howard University, as of like three weeks ago. Um, uh, before that, at the University of Texas San Antonio, uh, has written a book and uh, on the geographies of African American short fiction. And uh, I, I hesitate to tell you about his book because it's sort of the most reductive manifestation of, of an incredibly active mind and digital practice. Uh, he, he did his PhD at University of Kansas, working with Mary Emma Graham and working on the history of black writing. And uh, he, he uh, lives and breathes uh, digital scholarship and, uh, and literary scholarship. Uh, he also teaches a course uh, called the Jay-Z course, which uh, uh, locates the, the the artists in the history of uh, autobiographical, autobiography and semi-autobiographical work. And it's probably a lot more fun than the course I talk, taught on, uh, on autobiography, which was like Rousseau and St. Augustine. So, uh, so I'd rather take uh, Ken's class any day. Anyway, thrilled to have um, these three speakers. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kenton to start us off. All right, good morning. Um, I'm gonna share, uh, first off, I'm really happy to be here today to kind of report on what's going on with the commission. It's very diverse and I have a few prepared notes that I wanna talk about. In all of this, as even as James mentioned, my interest in Jay-Z, I got an a incredible reminder of how I started this journey around 2009, working in the actual spaces of libraries. I visited the Brooklyn Museum to see the exhibit and once again, I was inspired particularly seeing so many black faces in the Brooklyn Library and how can these spaces, how is it more than just books going on? So I wanna kind of report on a little bit of this. As a member of ACLS's Commission on Fostering Diverse Scholarship, I've gained valuable insight into the challenges and opportunities in digital scholarship. Today, I'll share those some personal stories of mine to highlight our discussions and how uh, some of these recommendations have been made. I want to stress the critical role of libraries and librarians in digital humanities research, specifically in data work. My experiences enriched by libraries and interactions with spaces have shaped my development as a scholar. So through a brief personal timeline, I aim to illustrate the depth of our discussions and kind of talk about how networks, infrastructure, and labor are a part of all of this. So, um, from 2009 to 2010, in my undergraduate years, delving into metadata catalogs at the Schomburg and Harlem and Arban Avenue Research Library in Atlanta highlighted the pivotal role of librarians and librarians, libraries and librarians in shaping my journey as an African American lit scholar. Um, these experiences emphasize the importance of the actual space, a brick and mortar library. As a young black 20 year old, then these early encounters showcased that libraries transcend more than just book repositories. So my key takeaway from this first part was how do we expand access to spaces for students? How can we ensure successful programs continue and serve as models for others? Most importantly, how do we foster inclusivity to make diverse groups feel comfortable in libraries? These questions guide our path forward, emphasizing the integral role of librarians and libraries in shaping the future of digital humanities research. And I should also point out, um, excuse me, that I met my undergrad, I mean, my graduate advisor at the Schomburg as we were talking about digital scholarship. Again, these were uh, networks that weren't necessarily formal, but how have I benefited from them is what I like to talk about. Next, I wanna talk about, um, my time in graduate school. In my graduate studies at the University of Kansas, librarian and Ro Brian Rosenblum's mentor mentorship in DH was pivotal, sparking a profound exploration of leveraging data for the study of black novels. Teaming up with Brian, we identified the scarcity of quantitative studies on black novels leading to the creation of the 100 Novels Project. This initiative surveyed a diverse body of African-American literature emphasizing tagged data significance in literary databases and addressing gaps in accounting for variations in race, class, and gender. Again, with Professor Mary McGram, we secured a grant evolving this into the Black Book Project that uh, uh, sought to look at over a thousand novels. In essence, my graduate school experience underscored the importance of collaborating with colleagues of Brian as well as Brian. 
I had sustained, consistent, and supervised DH training even before this world of DH actually began. Now, most recently, during my tenure as an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Arlington, I worked closely with data librarian Peace Awesome Williamson to curate data sets on black literary art. Our collaborations extended to transforming data into interactive visualizations, contributing to publications, and creating a DH training materials, all aimed at empowering students with research methods at the intersection of data-driven research and black studies. When I first met Peace in 2015, we, shared, we bonded over our shared frustration of the lack of content on black subjects, and this fueled a five-year journey for us. We developed courses that bridged the gaps between metadata, visualizations, and black studies, introducing scholars to digital research methodologies and promoting digital research formats. One solution centered around data storytelling or emphasizing effective communication through narratives and visualizations. The key takeaway here is that the importance of meaningful collaborations. Meeting with Peace a month uh, into joining uh, as an assistant professor at UTA opened the doors to crucial collaborations. How can we encourage and facilitate such interactions and collaborations for others? In closing, I want us to back up and think about this exposure to data-driven research. Consistent and supervised DH training and meaningful collaborations is being somewhat of an un unofficial uh, network, a hidden or, or, or seemingly hidden network. So reflecting on my academic journey, libraries as a physical space and librarians as collaborators stand out as pivotal to my development. A key recommendation for me is that I actively advocate for bringing diverse groups into the physical spaces to showcase the possibilities of scholarship. Now at Howard University, as I reimagine black studies in the 21st century, involving librarians is a critical solution. My focus as a professor of black literature is on encourage, is, is encouraging new scholars to enter this realm. How do we encourage people to do that? So drawing parallels between current digital scholarship and the 1968 San Francisco University student strike where the Black Student Union emphasized preparing black students for community struggles, I consider how can digital technologies enhance black literary studies in the age of big data? However, the crucial question remains. Where do students and scholars get trained in digital scholarship? In navigating the future of digital scholarship, networks, mentorship, and other advantages are essential. In summary, this overview glimpses into our meaningful discussions, synthesizing the salient points for future recommendations. I take pride in this work on this commission, underscoring the transformative role of libraries, and I hope that at least a little bit through my own personal timeline, it kind of it uncovers how we talked about at least really promoting libraries at the center of this discussion of sustaining digital research. Thank you. Buenos dias, buenas tardes. Um, let me go ahead and switch this. So um, the title of my talk is Archives, Community, and Digital Scholarship, uh, Proof of Existence. I thank, uh, I thank James uh, Shulman and Carol Mandel for the invitation to speak on this panel today, and of course for their invitation to be part of this uh, prestigious um, a, a group of scholars who have come together to really think about the future of, uh, of, of uh, digital archives and, uh, and scholarship for our future generations. I open this talk with a call to action from Chicana scholar and activist Sherry Moraga, from, with who, who in her latest novel reminds us of the precarity of memory. If we do not actively work toward documenting our history, who will? How can we move forward towards the future if we do not have a past to hold on to. In this sense, the work that we have been doing at the University of Houston through Arte Publico Press, the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program, and the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Center has been fundamental in the creation of spaces that center Latinx voices and lives in the present with an eye to the future. Arte Publico Press is a nonprofit publishing house that was funded and directed by Dr. Nicolás Canelos in an effort to create a publishing venue for Latinos in the US. The press has published uh, to date more than 750 titles with only 10% of them going out of, out of print. 
Uh, the titles are published for children, youth, and adults in English, Spanish, and bilingually. In the 1990s, Canelos and a group of scholars and specialists in various disciplines, language, literature, history, political science, sociology, in the US came together to work towards the creation of a program that would document, preserve, and make available the written legacy of Latinos from the colonial period until 1980. Because as we were working on contemporary publications, we were realizing that there was so many more materials that were in existence already in the US that were not being archived uh, anywhere in the US. So under the careful guidance and leadership of librarians, especially the work of Elvetia Martel from the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, they developed a, a very sturdy um, infrastructure for digitization, metadata, curation, and post-custodial praxis. Today, the recovery program is an alternative digital archive who is working, who has worked very closely with our colleagues at the University of Houston Libraries uh, Special Collections to hold all the physical uh, materials that we produce. So in the past uh, 40, 40 years, the recovery program has recovered and microfilmed thousands of original books, manuscripts, and archival items uh, in ephemera in English, Spanish, French, and Ladino, digitized and microfilmed 1,500 historical newspapers, uh, digitized a vast collection of photographs, created an extensive authority list of approximately 5,000 um, writers, published the first comprehensive anthologies of Latino literature, built databases and bibliography, held biannual, confer biannual conferences, which by the way, we will be hosting our next conference in April, and you're all welcome to, to, to Houston, uh, printed over 45 volumes of recovered uh, materials, built partnerships with national and international archives institutions and organizations so that we can return cultural national patrimonies back to the original uh, countries, right? To Dominican Republic, Cuba, uh, Mexico, Spain. We've also created an interdisciplinary board of specialists and thus established the field of US Latino studies as we know it today. All these activities include working with graduate and undergraduate students in their professionalization in humanities by learning how to build these networks, right? And, 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 and learning through primary resources archival praxis, digital humanities, from an ethical and holistic way that centers the communities that inform the investigation. The communities that are represented in, in, in all of our work are, have a, their first seat at the table, and they, as much as possible, give us the opportunity and inform what we do with those, uh, with those um, uh, the visualizations or publications that we derive from there. What follows are some of the examples of the work that we have created over the past um, uh, seven years through the creation of the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Center, which was funded in great part by the Mellon Foundation. Uh, Don Waters and Patricia Shui, who are our like, godparents, really have ushered us and moved and, and allowed us to extend and leverage the work that Arte Público and Recovery had been doing for the past 40 years into the future. Um, this center is an extension of the recovery program, so we built uh, digital exhibits, maps, uh, uh, we do text analysis, Twitter bots, we publish open source digital editions, um, uh, data sets with free low bandwidth software that can be accessed through a phone, right? Uh, we work uh, with, uh, as much as possible with software that, that allows us to produce materials in Spanish. And so, as you can see, as you will see, these activities are allowing us to take the archive that used to live, would, would often live behind institutional walls into the hands of our community who are now seeing themselves represented in the archives and special collections. So this first example that I have is of the Alonso Perales collection. This is the archive of one of the founders of the League of United Latin American Citizens, one of the oldest Hispanic civil rights organizations founded in 1929. The family uh, gave the collection to, uh, to the recovery program because they wanted it to be processed immediately and to be put into the hands of users. When the collection was transferred to special collections to the University of Houston, uh, one of the boxes was returned to us because it included several envelopes that did not have a letter attached to them. So the archivist, um, the, the, our, two of our team members, uh, Teresa Mayfield, who was a volunteer, uh, and Lorena Gothero, who is our digital programs manager, took the, the, the items back and after carefully looking at the envelopes, decided to extract the metadata from them. They then proceeded to create a map that documented the important role that Alonso Perales played in the U.S. Uh, community from 1920 to 1960. So if you look at the map, you see 
his the reach that this one person had before we had internet access and or anything else. So you can see his 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 home was in in, uh, in San Antonio, and his his reach is broad and wide across the United United States, thus representing the the presence of a Latino community who was actively documented and and and. Uh, documenting the cases of discrimination that were happening all over the US. In his records, we find a whole set of approximately 1,500 affidavits that document this. Um, the next example that I wanna talk to you about really quickly is, uh, is, the, is our, um, the, our um, junior scholars program that we instituted um, just recently through the digital archive in, in, uh, in, in USLDH. So what we're doing is we're taking the digital archive and, tra and digital training into the elementary schools. As we know, uh, our education in Texas is under attack. Um, there's, a, there's been a, a state takeover of the largest uh, di um, district in the Houston area. And so with modest funding from a partnership with LULAC Council, we took um, all these materials into the archive. We trained 75 students how to incorporate primary resources into, into a digital project, into a digital timeline. So you see here students uh, writing, selecting, researching, uh, working together collaboratively to create a digital timeline that would allow them to showcase and see that they have a part in making history. Students at the end felt that they were powerful because they now knew that history could be rewritten, that history has, is made up of many voices, ganadores y perdedores, winners and losers, that even little fourth graders with, with, with a minimal uh, knowledge of English or Spanish, knew that their history and the, and the input that they brought into history was very valuable. And the very last uh, example that I wanna give you is we created an art community archiving day so that we could bring, in, in bring uh, our, the Houston community, the Latino community together in a space to provide them with preservation kits, uh, allow them to digitize their materials, uh, to talk to an archivist, and it was a very productive activity. As you can see, the, we had a, uh, one of our state representatives, Cristina Morales, who is the, the founder and, and director of uh, Morales Funeral Home, one of the first funeral homes to, um, set up to, um, uh, during the, the Jim Crow area when there was a lot of segregation in Texas. And so she brought in uh, all of her records and she brought in her mother's, um, her grandmother's uh, bedside uh, Bible, which included a lot of you know, important documents that were saved within the, within the, the, the Bible. And so she, she entrusted us with this, with this uh, Bible, and so we're now consulting with uh, scholars and digital humanists across the nation to see how best to, you know, to, to, to preserve this and also to make it available as a virtual exhibit. Uh, people documented places that no longer exist in Houston that were Latino-based. And the last thing that I, I know my time is up, but I wanna mention that one of the last things that, that we showcase is that, that was brought to us, it really is bringing our work uh, really full circle. Um, somebody brought in um, the, their mother's apron. So to me, this really documents the, the, how our community is, is seeing that their artifacts, that their personal materials belong in an archive, that there's a space for them, that we should safeguard them, that, that we should, when we look at that apron and we see the grease, the, the grease stains, we see an, an active mother, a woman who is not only mothering her immediate family, but she's also mothering a community that is, uh, that is, that is active and that has always been present in the US. Um, I'll read just the last two lines of my conclusion, which is, um, I'm sorry for this. Um, so we know that these efforts continue, all these efforts that we are putting forth through Arte Publico Recovery USLDH continue to strengthen the pathways that will teach us to recover and celebrate the past now, as Michelle Caswell, Marika Sifor, Mario H. Ramirez, our, our, our colleague librarians and archivists are, are reminding us that if we can preserve and document our history now, we can firmly and, and securely walk into our future, understanding that there are generations that will not have to look back to see if they did have roots because they have always been here. Thank you. Oh, you had more good stuff. <laughs> She didn't. Come back and tell us about the other song. <laughs>
<laughs> so um, thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Ken. And um, so I am actually not going to talk about all those eight infrastructure layers. I think uh, uh, Gabby and uh, Kenton have given you a a good feel for these these kind of layers of community and layers of personal connection and networking and training. Um, because this is CNI, um, I'm gonna. I, I want to. I want help, um, and uh, I want help from all of you and and. The folks in the competing presentations, maybe they can come and help us uh, when they see the recordings, um, to, to talk about the, the platforms and, and technologies um, aspects of, of what we're doing. And, and um, so, you know, um, this gang at uh, CNI has, for like 25 years, been talking about, um, you know, the digital humanities and how to support and sustain it and how to preserve it. And um, there's just been uh, terrific work and, um, and the challenges continue, remain. Um, I, you know, this, I'm not gonna go all of, uh, go through um, this. These are all familiar to you and, and I, you know, put the last one, support, support, support. I think you uh, heard a lot about what support has meant uh, to, to work that's, uh, important and going on. What I want to do um, today is is put the lens of diverse digital scholarship, the work in um, digital work in racial and social justice. I want to put the, that lens on these issues. So we're all working on them, but I think when you put that lens on it, it might change priorities or perspectives or urgencies for what we might do first. So that's what I um, want to do today. So, um, okay, I wasn't sure how these uh, actually worked. <laughs> Sorry, they didn't do that on my computer. <laughs> They're doing it the way I wanted it. But um, so, as you heard, um, important work is happening outside as well as within institutions. And as you can imagine um, and know, that's really a challenge for what kind of technologies folks can have available to them, what kind of platforms they can use. And, and even as great tools have been developed, we, it still uh, presents enormous challenges for sustainability and, and preservation. So you, you know, communities have tools, they're doing things. Um, you heard from Maria Cotera in, um, in the spring, and, when I asked her what keeps her up at night, you know, this was her this was her answer, which uh, won't surprise any of you. But it it really does say, well, where we you know how do we work on this? Um, we're not just here in institutions working working on this. Um, oh, so does my next one slide into? Okay, so and um, as uh, as you've heard, important work is being done not just in R1 institutions that have the resources to build repositories and create technologies and support, but it's being done all across different kinds of institutions by folks who have different pressures on them, different kinds of support. Um, you heard, I, I, know, I know you did because we shared a a platform, a program platform at last, this time last year with Allison Levy when she talked about the, the Summer Institute at Brown for HBCU scholars that want to do digital work. And they get great training in that three weeks at Brown. And then they go back to real life um, and the, the kinds of workloads that they have. And really, they have to rely on support from other places and other institutions and other help desks if they're going to get help because they're not getting it at home, and that provide you know, so we have to think about how do these infrastructures reach across institutions. Um, okay, my next button. Oh. Okay, float. Um, and, and when communities, and when you're working with this kind of content, the creators, and, and I think Gabby really brought that home, the communities need to have access to it and be empowered to, to control and govern it, and that all has implications. You know, it's one thing to work within our walled, our cultivated walled institutional gardens, but when you open those up, it creates all kinds of um, 
challenges. And um, I think uh, Merkur 2 is a, you know, a platform familiar to many of you, and if not, please look into it. And Kim Christian, one of our um, commissioners, has um, spoken a lot about why it was created and, and the way it enables communities to describe things in the way they want to describe them and share them or not share them in the way they want to share them. And it's a great model. Um, it's got lots of uses. Um, and an R1 institution, you know, um, Washington State helped uh, create it, but it's uh, promulgated widely. But it's a, it's a, it, we need more of it. We need more people using it. We need to make sure it thrives and survives. Um, it has its own challenges. Also, it's a platform for um, description and access. It's, um, it's not a preservation um, solution for this work. And as we look at repository work, um, here's a, a quote from one of our 23 focus groups as Zoe Wade Hyde was talking about um, how the humanities commons core is trying to look at what kinds of uh, features are, are needed um, for community control. And it's a, you know, it's a tricky concept, preservation and holding it closed versus letting people in to say, no, I want to take it out. Um, brings a whole other level of um, challenges to look at. And um, we, as we talked in the focus groups, it was clear that this kind of work needs a very um, wide audience. I mean, that's always been true, digital humanists. Um, how do you create, for any d digital humanist in, in lots of fields, how do you create um, a trade book? Um, for a digital humanities project? How do you uh, make a bestseller out of it? Um, and, as, and, and more and more of this kind of work needs to reach very different kinds of audiences. Darcy Cullen, who's in charge of the Raven Space um, project, which brings um, indigenous co um, cultural content in, into um, actually an online kind of uh, pub rich publication. University of British Columbia Press talked about how they're discovering how wide their audience needs to be, how different it is from the way they're used to doing outreach. It brings all uh, a whole variety of other kinds of outreach problems. And, it, well, outreach challenges and opportunities, excuse me, not problems. Um, and I think the really overarching um, issue is that because this work is reparative and um, and rediscovers and fills this deep gap of untold stories. We can't fill that gap and then let it disappear once we've done it. Um, you know, so there's this just imperative for sustainability and preservation um, that, I mean, I, I think just listening to the folks here uh, make, make clear, um, I was very struck um, by the way, um, uh, John Stroop at Princeton ta talked about it in one of our focus groups, and so I'll read some of that. Um, uh, the, the quote, um, that sustainability has to be a pillar of how we present any initiatives going forward, and he was thinking about the project they've done at Princeton and Princeton and slavery. We're putting forward something that reflects not just scholarship, but a different view on how, uh, on on values at our institution is shifting. And we risk saying, well, this was important now, and now we're done. You know, we can't treat this as a trend. Um, if we're going to move this front and center, it's got to stay for a time that goes well past the span of any of our careers. So I, I think that just <laughs> really struck me, and it's really hard. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to um, take these one at a time. I'm going to bring them all up in the interests of time. Um, some of the things that we're looking at as kind of objectives for recommendations or directions for recommendations, it's become pretty clear to us, um, and this was true of digital humanities in general, but because there's a, been a lot of grant support for this kind of work, that institutions really need to realize that humanists actually work together, they don't just work alone, that they actually, you know, um, need administrative support for grants and funding, that they hire people, and, um, and they uh, certainly um, have, you know, 
um, data sets and lots of um, technology. And that requires a kind of rethink within their departments, within their schools, within the institution. Um, when we look, I mean, I know that everybody at CNI is working all the time to fill in the puzzle pieces of infrastructure that will manage data, bring it forward, preserve things. But when we, I think we just need to be bolder and faster because this work is so important and we need to take um, more new approaches and give it higher priority and especially some of the repository parts of that work. Um, we need to, uh, funding, we need to look at funding approaches that um, don't just say, oh, that's a great new project, go out and do it, but also help us fund work on infrastructure and sustainability and on maintenance if we have to redo something. And that's a change, I think, in funding priorities. And it's been very clear talking in our focus groups that folks need help across institutions and that we need third party kinds of organizations too that can help. So where are these help desks coming from? And I'm just kind of describing there some of the kinds of support um, that we um, need to be giving. So um, our recommendations are gonna focus on how we can create more environments, more programs, organizations and kind of purposeful convenings. I'm gonna to look to Cliff, I haven't had a chance to, you know, of we need a, I don't know, a CNI takeoff or a ways to convene around some of these questions so that we can keep working in focused ways across all kinds of um, disciplines where we can put all these different expertises and perspectives together. So, um, so uh, we're gonna need your help is all I can say. So. Uh, we definitely have a, a few minutes for uh, for questions or comments or suggestions. It's always helpful to have adjoining rooms because you hear the clapping and <laughs> Carol knew it was time to stop. So um, uh, welcome thoughts, questions, concerns uh, of any kind. Hi, I'm Jen Stringer from Getty. Um, I'm wondering, Carol, when you were talking about you know, technical support and infrastructure, so my, my mind is sort of spinning on, there are lots of open source platforms, but many smaller cultural heritage groups don't have the technical wherewithal to actually, you know, Getty has something called Arches, welcome to use it, good <laughs> luck, you know what I mean? And so um, I'm wondering if, if you had more specific recommendations around you know, ways to create collaborations or, you know, fund shared infrastructure and resources, you know, how, anyway, I'm just interested in your thoughts on how that, that, that might work. I should make James answer this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll answer it by saying that the recommendations are still in process, so, so that's a great feedback. It's certainly something that we all have experienced it and in the in the commission we've talked a lot about how, what those reciprocal relationships are with communities and, and including what uh, what a community should put in its MOU when it gets involved with a university like here's what we need from you rather than just you know okay thanks for your help and where are you now so so i think i think um, scalable and supportable platforms and tools and usable tools. I mean, Maria, who spoke last year, uh, uses Clouder because she finds, you know, and obviously there's not gonna be one answer or one platform, but for, for the communities that she works with, they she finds for describing uh, objects and data, it's been very helpful and very, a little training goes a long way. So, so I think that's that that would be the uh, the the gist of realistic relationships that um, provide the kind of support that actually help projects both go forward and also be taken care of, stewarded in the right ways, ethically over the longer term. But but that's another example is Maria gets help from Illinois to use Clouder, mm -hmm. and so it's across institutional support, um, even though she's at an R one, um, and and so. We're not going to have a list of, and we need, but but I think if we can really articulate some of the kinds of things that we need, and then create, um, you know, start knocking on doors or create convenings where people can talk about that, you know. So it's it's the beginning of the 
moving in directions. So thank you for what you just said, because it was perfect. Can I ask one more question? I'm also thinking about connecting disparate archives to your point of how do you follow things in sort of, you know, that are connected. And I'm thinking of the idea of linked data and, and, um, mm -hmm. and, Good point. and using vocabularies in the right way, mm -hmm. and yet not putting this tremendous burden on these smaller institutions and organizations that are just trying to collect the stuff and preserve it, you know? And so I'm just, anyway, it's another thought to put out there in terms of, you know, encouraging whatever the right practices are that allow these things to not only live on, but be discoverable beyond just, you know, that small subset of scholarship. And I, th I think um, that's, you know, you'll see the PID suggestion there. Um, and, and also, um, you know, I think Coherent Digital, for example, if you've looked at its products, is a way, is such a lightweight way of being able to pull up and link and find information. So that's the kind of um, overlays and lightweight, you know, what is what are the few most important things? Because how much can you expect mm -hmm. from uh, communities to do? But can I add something? Oh, but please. Do um, community, uh, small communities are using some of these material. I mean, they are, you know, they, they are knowledgeable of some of these, you know, the uses of metadata and, 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 and these protocols. They may not have enough trained people to do it, but it is happening because a lot of these community organizations do want their materials to be discoverable. So I think it's also a shift from a lot of these organizations to begin to think about like James said, how can we serve these communities and incorporate them because they, they're existing and they're working with those, but those parameters have not thought of them, right? They're not, they're not created for them. And so we do a lot of, of rewriting uh, subject headings, you know, working with Library of Congress to correct and to better describe the materials that we have because we want, you know, we're part of the system, but we're not included in the ecosystem. I hope my question is less than a minute uh, for response. It's for the scholars. Hello, I'm Athena, and I have the pleasure and honor to work with Gabby at the <laughs> University of Houston, and I hope we are doing the best we can mm -hmm. for her organization because it's really important to the libraries. I hope you know that. Um, so my question is to both of you. Um, you spoke um, in, your origin in your first um, talk about space and the place, and we're in a, at an event centered on digitization and network but I also am from a uh, Latinx background, and I do see the value of our uh, reclaiming space, the physical space. And I was curious what, if you had any pondering, ponderings on how we can connect space and this work for our students and for our communities and our institutions. If you have any recommendations or ideas, that'd be really helpful. And if you want to connect it to CNI, I know I went off script, but I thought this would be a good opportunity to ask that. <laughs> Yeah, I might uh, start on thinking about that as uh, one thing I should say, I'm a Mellon fellow as well. So every connection to the library was facilitated word of mouth wise, word of mouth. Oh, you should go here and check this out. And while just happening to be there, I would happen upon other people who would say things. So even as we're thinking about even the structural things with this particularly, I'm thinking about how do we even get people in a space to even have conversations to begin with? And then one of the things that I am seeing is just like, again, going back to my example of just visiting the Brooklyn uh, Public Library, having different types of exhibits that might speak to different types of audiences is at least, I think, one of the first steps in inviting people into these spaces. Again, I think so much can happen from conversations, even when thinking about infrastructure for the future, but how do we even get different voices in a single room to even start expressing those concerns freely? So again, this is just my idea about this, but a lot of different types of exhibits that actually invite you into the space where you say, oh, gotcha. <laughs> And I think I would just add, uh, echoing what uh, uh, Kenton said, also, I know the, the physical space, and as, as our uh, amazing dean has said many times to our, our constituents, the library is the heart of the university, right? It, it pulses for the university, and it shares, you know, all the lifelines. Um, but even saying this, our, our now our, our current library now has, you know, a check-in ID where you, in order for you to access the space, you know, you have to, you know, be a student or you have to be a member or you, or, or you have to have a, an ID. So maybe taking the library, the, the opening that space to other places outside within the university campus, right? Going maybe to the dorms or having like public events 
uh, public events at a community center where the, the University of Houston Libraries or any other library goes into these spaces to really show that there is a commitment, right, of outreach into the into their communities because uh, you know our, our communities are now aware that they belong, but there's still barriers that are that you know the, the infrastructure continues to put on because you know whether we like it or not they continue to tell us that we don't belong there, right? So. Um, so I think it, the, that presence, physical presence, outside of those spaces goes a very long way. Thank you. And thank you for getting Gabby and uh, Kenton to keep helping us with recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yay. That was our unofficial ending. <laughs> I'm now going to provide our official ending, which is that thank you all. I mean, we would love to hear from you as as thoughts uh, circulate and you echo in your ear. Um, you know, again, the timetable for this is in the first quarter of the year. We're actually now we 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 have something like 80 quotes from uh, commissioners and or focus group participants that we're vetting with them. We're also working on uh, illustrations, you know, str strategic illustrations to sort of liven up the report. And we're looking at platforms to publish it on so that it can be both a linear report, but also can have access for different people. You know, if you're a, a vice provost for research or if you're, uh, you know, a department chair in the humanities department, you might be interested in more you know, entering it in, in non-linear ways. Mm -hmm. So those are the things we're working on now and, and, and spinning out soon. But I just, I just want to say, you know, what a great honor and treat it is to work with the, the 21 people on, these com on this commission. Because as you've seen, the, you know, the, we could spend all day with each of them. And so, so thank you both for, for joining us today and thank you all for, for joining us for this discussion. <laughs>